I'm Matt Doran. Imagine for a moment a family in agonising mourning after the blood-soaked murder of a young wife and her two youngest children. Picture, if you can, their shock and dismay as they hear the psychotic killer has escaped custody and is on a violent rampage across their city. Finally, imagine their almost overwhelming terror, wondering if the monster will target them again. What you're about to see is a true Australian horror story. One afternoon in August 1978, a mother with two of her youngest children is returning home from a shopping trip to her semi-rural home on Sydney's Fringe. OK. Yeah. OK, honey. Valda Connell, her 10-year-old daughter Sally and 4-year-old son Damien arrive home, disturbing a known violent criminal ransacking their house. Don't move! Stay in the car! He abducts them, drives them to isolated areas across northern New South Wales where he will abuse, taunt and eventually kill all three. And although police will catch up with him, his reign of terror and the pain inflicted on the surviving family members will not end there. In the 1970s, Borkham Hills in Sydney's northwest is one of the city's fastest growing residential areas, with rural and semi-rural properties being replaced with housing estates and affordable project homes. While the surrounding landscape changes from fields to suburban lots, the Connell family, Paul, Valda and their six children live on one of the few remaining rural properties. For us as kids, I think it was a pretty perfect life. Really looking back, you don't realise how well off we were and how lucky we were to have 56 acres. And we had a, cows and horses and goats and a pig even that we won at the fate and um, ducks and we used to go eeling over at the dam. And, you know, life was so safe. It was so innocent, I suppose, living like that. We're a very close family, even though it was uh, myself and then four sisters. Uh, before I uh, finally got a brother, um, but yeah, we still were very close. Uh, we had uh, we had to enjoy each other's company, and I think that uh, we did do that. And that was, um, I suppose, also largely uh, that my parents nurtured us in uh, that sort of supportive way. Life for the Connell family is like living in a conservative country town, even though they're just 30 kilometres from Sydney's city centre. They enjoy a close bond with other families in the area, often inviting them on excursions to the beach. The Connells are also a religious family and it's a very important part of their life. They attend Mass every Sunday and say the Rosary together each night. The church was important to, uh, to uh, all of us as a family. Um, both mum and dad were strong in the church and again those values were instilled on us. Um, it was a community thing but I guess it was the way they lived their lives. They were, they were very moral people who uh, actually acted uh, in, in a very Christian way and, and tried to help others and, and people in the community. Friday, the 11th of August, 1978, was just another day for Valda Connell. The 39-year-old mother of six spends the day doing housework, playing tennis with friends and caring for her four-year-old son, Damien. That afternoon, Valda has Damien with her as she goes to collect her second youngest, Sally, aged 10, from school. You should come, Damien. Valda's other children are old enough to make their own way home. Hello. Hi, Sally. How was your day, honey? Good. Um, we need a cool science project. Uh-huh. 
While Valda is collecting Sally from school, a new resident in the area is prowling the streets. He's recently paroled armed robber John Ernest Cribb. Cribb, after being released on parole, um, part of the, the conditions of his parole was that he was to stay with his parents at Kilabar Creek. Uh, but sometime after that, he left and went to stay with his sister at Borkham Hills. On this particular Friday, uh, which was the um, 11th of August, uh, Cribb was at home and he decided to go out and uh, he left the sister's premises and uh, wandered the streets, went to a local hotel, uh, consumed uh, a quantity of alcohol, um, slightly intoxicated, and uh, then he um, reverted to what he knew best, and that was committing crime. Cribb leaves the hotel at around 2.30 in the afternoon. Stuffed down his trousers is a knife. He will later tell police that he bought the knife soon after his release, claiming it was for his own protection. Cribb is now looking for a house to break into. His first three attempts are unsuccessful, deterred by watchful neighbours or a barking dog. He eventually comes to the Connell house. It's isolated, with no neighbours close by. So he goes to the backyard and cuts away a fly screen to gain entry. He then uh, went through the premises, uh, stole a large amount of property, suitcases and other electrical equipment, and uh, a 12-gauge shotgun. Um, after he'd uh, been in the home for a while, he then uh, walked to the front gate and he put the property, the suitcases and other bits and pieces of property, uh, near the front gate. Uh, probably with the intention of, uh, after he'd completed his, whatever he was doing in the house, to gather the property together and uh, leave the area. Just as Cribb is leaving the house, Velda Connell and her two children arrive home. At this point, there's nothing to warn them of Cribb's presence or that anything is wrong. There are many things running through Cribb's mind, but foremost is his newfound freedom. He doesn't want to get caught. He makes his move. In a panic, Cribb now starts planning his next move. It will horrify the nation and turn him into one of Australia's most notorious criminals. On a winter's afternoon in August 1978, 39-year-old Valda Connell has arrived at her Borkham Hills home in northwest Sydney with her 10-year-old daughter Sally and her 4-year-old son Damien. They're about to disturb a recently paroled violent criminal, John Ernest Cribb, who's broken in and is busy gathering his loot. Hearing the car pull up, Cribb is trapped. He makes a decision. Whatever it takes, he is not going back to jail. Don't move! Don't move! Stay in the car! Oh, shut, shut up! Shut up! I just robbed your house! Car, don't hurt it! Just robbed your house! Don't move! Move over! Move over! Don't move! Stay in the car! Don't look at me! Stay in the car! Don't move! Don't move! He picks up the stolen property he'd left by the front gate and throws it in the boot. Stay in the car! Stay in the goddamn car! Then jumps in the driver's seat and makes his escape. 
Cribb wants to get away fast. He doesn't want to risk any locals seeing him in the Connell's car. He drives north, arriving at Barara Waters on the Hawkesbury River. This is where his girlfriend lives, and he knows the area well. Yeah, John Ernest Cribb did have a long criminal record. Um, even from a young person, he'd been in and out of jail on several occasions, had a lot of dealings with the police for criminal activity. At the time uh, of this crime, he was actually out on parole, uh, having been sentenced to 12 years for armed robbery. And uh, it's quite interesting when you look at those armed robberies that there's a similarity in the type of facts of those armed robberies to this particular case, in that in those armed robberies, he um, broke into homes, um, uh, took people hostage and then decamped in, in the motor vehicle from the home. So there was a similarity in those crimes to the ones that he committed now. The area where Cribb chooses to stop is hidden from the main road. He's sure there won't be anyone around to disturb him. He pulls a knife on hey. Velda Connell, threatening the lives of her children if she tries to escape. If you go anywhere, I will hurt the kids. You listen to this, OK? OK. OK! OK, just don't hurt the kids. Just. This is boss, yep. all right? OK. He's boss, so don't go anywhere. Say yes. OK, he will find yes, you. OK. We'll, you'll find him. Pass me that. Hurry up, pass it. Cribb sees one of Velda's dresses on the back seat and gets Sally to hand it over to him then proceeds to cut it into long strips. Valda stays quiet and tries to remain calm, doing whatever Cribb asks without argument. Get out of the car. Get out of the car! You stay here. Right, that's enough. Come on, let's go. Come Sally on. can only watch on helplessly as Cribb threatens and manhandles her mother and four-year-old brother. Sit down. Binding their hands and feet and gagging them with the strips of torn material. Stay there. Hands. Hands. Not making it easy for me, are you? Come stay still. Stay still. He then leaves them, returns to the car, and drives off with Sally. Remember, I've got your kid, don't so don't try anything. Cribb now makes a very calculated move. He drives to a nearby service station where he forces young Sally to give him her home telephone number. He phones Velda's husband, Paul, and using the alias Warren, he tells him that he and Velda are having an affair and that she and the two children have run away with him. The idea of saying this was just part of a cover-up to give him time to make good his escape, trying to make out that this was a domestic issue and that the wife and the children had left, which was totally, completely out of character uh, for this family. Cribb's attempt to buy himself time doesn't go to plan. Paul Connell immediately contacts police and their response is swift. I uh, came home and uh, I saw the uniformed police there in the driveway. I uh, wasn't sure what the problem was at first and uh, then I saw uh, Linda standing there with the policeman and I uh, got out of the car and she said, um, uh, someone's taken mum and the kids and uh, Sally and Damien. And I suppose it's, it's sort of disbelief as to what are you talking about, how, how could this happen? And, uh, and then I remember walking in and there was uh, quite a few people there uh, already at that stage, just a few relatives. 
this in hindsight probably was about an hour and a half after they'd gone and uh, there was a state of confusion in the house um, and uh, as I say unsure what to do or, or what was going to happen next. I remember dad sitting on the veranda looking out to the stars and I remember saying to him don't worry dad when they come home we'll have a big party because I was a very young and a very naive well innocent we lived in an age of innocence crime scene examinations of the connell house uncover fingerprints left by the kidnapper but in 1978 matching fingerprints to those on record was a manual task that could take as long as two weeks the best chance police had of finding Velda and her children is to find the vehicle, and Crib knew this. Messages were sent out all over the state to look for this motor vehicle and a description of the occupants. Police were advised in all areas to search motel car parks and, and uh, places where somebody might stay overnight. Crib can't be sure Valda's husband hasn't contacted the police, so he waits until dark and then sets off with Valda and the children. He heads north, travelling the quieter inland roads to avoid detection. However, less than 50 kilometres north of Barara Waters, at a place called Central Mangrove, the car runs out of petrol. Crib forces Valda to help push the car off the road and into a clearing. The children remain in the vehicle. Harder. Push. Harder. Christ's sake. He turns to Valda, who's exhausted from pushing, and grabs the young mother of six. Threatening the lives of her two young children, he overpowers the slim-built Valda and pushes her to the ground. <laughs> then rips at her clothing, holds the knife to her throat and rapes her. Remember who's boss? Remember? As best we can determine, the children were, uh, were bound and gagged uh, back at uh, the Mangrove Mountain area when Crib uh, forced the mother from the car and uh, sexually assaulted her. And uh, it, it's, it's not known whether the children actually saw the rape take place, but it's a reasonable hypothesis that they did. Remember, who's boss? Who's boss? Be quiet. <laughs> He told us that the whole time the mother was pleading with him, uh, not so much for herself, but uh, for the safety of her children. Uh, she was asking for protection for the children, that they wouldn't be hurt or injured. And she tried to talk to him. Uh, they're a very religious family, and at some st it's several times he indicated that she talked to him about religion. Um, but obviously this had no effect on him at all. After the assault, Crib goes searching for petrol, leaving his three victims tied up in the vehicle. Having been threatened by him, and the fact that he's a control freak, and the fact that uh, he's got a criminal background, and the fact that the mother had been interfered with in front of the children, she would be under a great deal of stress and anxiety. She would be terrified to do anything except do what he said. She was totally under his control. And uh, I feel a lot of sympathy for her in her position because she just couldn't do anything. It's a trait that's pretty much common within the criminal element, um, more so in, in, in some than others. But they seem to have this, this overbearing ability to, uh, even without words, they seem to be able to threaten people by their very demeanour the manner in which they look at people, 
the manner in which they treat people and they're able to they're able to scare people to the point where people are incapable of doing anything to extricate themselves from the position they're in. Bearing in mind Mrs Connell and her children were uh, were bound at most of, at most of the time and uh, wouldn't have been able to get away anyway. Crib returns about an hour or so later with petrol for the car and continues his journey north with his three captives who by now are cold, hungry and frightened. And at this point of time, the, the family, the mother and the two children have been under his control in his custody um, for several hours. Uh, so you can imagine the fear and the apprehension that, uh, that the mother would have been under. Please, would you just let us go, please? We won't stay. Even here. after her terrifying Never ordeal, Valda still to tries go. to reason with Crib to let her and the children go. We just want to get Shut out up. of the car. Shut please. up. I'm trying to think. Just think about letting us go. Just Look, do you want to go another up. round? Shut up. <laughs> her pleas please. fall on deaf ears. He keeps driving. He may appear to be just driving as far away as possible to avoid police, but in reality, he knows exactly where he's going and what he plans to do next. You can let them go. I'll stay with you if you want, just please. I'm trying to think. Be quiet. Valda, Sally and young Damien are to face more horror and torment. Convicted armed robber John Ernest Cribb has abducted a mother and her two young children after a botched robbery at their Borkham Hills home on the outskirts of Sydney. He's been driving them north using back roads to avoid police. Ah. After running out of petrol near Central Mangrove, he forces 39-year-old Valda Connell to push her car into a secluded area and then rapes her while her children are left bound and gagged in the car. It's now the early hours of Saturday morning. Crib drives to a picnic area at a place called Allenborough Falls, near where his parents live, southwest of Port Macquarie. Crib had been to this exact location only the week before while on a family outing. The interesting thing about that, it's interesting when you look at the characteristics of serial killers uh, and killers generally, that they like to go to places where they've either been before or they've got some control. The reason he went to Allenborough Falls is that he'd been there. He knew it well and he'd been there a week before. So that in driving into this place at midnight, where no other person is there, it's pitch black, um, he still knew the area he had control. Please. They stop there for a short while and then head to the nearby township of Comboyne. Seven kilometres from the town, Crib slows the car and tells Valda that this is where he will leave her and the children. He even shows Valda where she can walk to to get help. But Crib is playing a game with his captives. He's teasing them. He doesn't stop at the drop-off point and continues on further, taking the car to an isolated bush clearing near Allenborough Falls. It was a dirt track uh, from memory, a bush dirt track. Um, and at this stage, it's about one o'clock in the morning. Uh, it could be a little bit after that, but around about one o'clock in the morning. And he decides to leave them. My memory of it, um, the mother and the two children are left together in the bush, several metres from the road in the pitch black. Okay, you stay here overnight? 
Don't go anywhere. You can go into town in the morning, but you stay here. They have no knowledge of where they are. They are unable to break free and unable to call for help. He now drives south towards Newcastle, intending to leave his victims to their fate. But then, as he drives, he begins to change his mind. You have to go back. They're going to go to court. They know every single bloody detail. Drove away and was indeed, for all intents and purposes, was on his way, leaving the scene, and was going to leave them there alive, uh, just bound and gagged in the bush. But um, he had second thoughts uh, after only travelling a number of kilometres uh, south. And I, we believe that this was because uh, he'd had some uh, discussions with Mrs Connell in the car where he believed that he had identified himself certainly as John and maybe even further. And I think it scared him to the point where he thought, I'd best do something about this. Again, for Cribb, his freedom is paramount. Fearing Valder will identify him to police, he drives back to the isolated bush clearing. The devil inside tells him he needs to silence his captives for good. It can only be imagined what is going through Valder's mind as she sees the headlights. It may be hope that it's someone coming to rescue her, but if so, it quickly fades when out of the thick scrub, a familiar figure emerges. <laughs> Mrs Connell was facing him, bound and gagged, uh, and he stabbed her in the centre of the chest. Uh, he stabbed her numerous times, and as best could be uh, determined by the pathologist, 13 times. And there were defence wounds uh, on her body. So obviously there was some type of, even though she was gagged and bound, there was some type of struggle uh, by her. Uh, then he um, went to the little boy, the four-year-old boy, and stabbed him twice and killed him. Uh, this left the little girl still alive. Uh, she witnessed this. She witnessed the mother being stabbed and she witnessed the little brother being stabbed. And then he stabbed her. And I think from memory six times he stabbed her. All the wounds were from the front. So each of the people were uh, approached from the front. They would have been fully aware of uh, what was happening to them. Uh, terrifying is not a strong enough word, and I really don't know a word that would describe the horror that would have passed through her mind at the time she was being killed, and the absolute horror that the kids, the children, would have been experiencing seeing this happening to their mother. I just truly cannot think of words to describe what must have gone through their mind. John Ernest Cribb has now gone from armed robber to a calculating vicious murderer. After 10-year-old Sally has taken her last breath, Cribb surveys his handiwork as the headlight beams filter through the scrub. Amazingly, his body is covered in so much blood and his adrenaline levels are so high, Cribb is totally unaware he has stabbed himself in the finger and cut his leg during the frenzy. Now, comprehending the enormity of what he has done, he heads back to the vehicle. He sits in the car quietly, puffing on a cigarette, contemplating his next move. It isn't long before he decides to drive off, heading for his parents' house just a short distance away. He drove there at two in the morning, he tiptoes in the back door, gets some clothing, must have washed up somewhere. The police are not aware of where. 
But after that, he went into his father's tool shed on the way back to the car, picked up a shovel. He was going to bury them where he'd killed them. But when he got back, the ground was rock hard. He couldn't get the shovel in. So he dragged them to the car, put them in the boot with the idea of burying them on a sandy beach somewhere towards Newcastle. Crib is now in a hurry and so brazenly takes the Pacific Highway south. He knows exactly how and where he plans to dispose of the bodies in the boot, but not everything goes his way. After abducting and murdering 39-year-old Valda Connell and her two children, 10-year-old Sally and 4-year-old Damien, John Cribb transports their bodies in the boot of her family's car, arriving at Caves Beach, just south of Newcastle, at around daybreak. Feeling he's alone, he begins to dig what is later described by police as being an almost perfect grave. And whilst he was digging the hole there, two little 12-year-old boys turned up on their push bikes, they just riding through the bush. They disturbed him and they said, what are you doing, mister? And he said, oh, I'm digging a hole. I've got three dead Alsatians in the boot of the car and I want to bury them. Um, the boys had a look at the car and they saw some property in the car and uh, I think they became a bit frightened, the boys, and they left, left the scene. And I think it was very, I think in hindsight it was good that they had left the scene because anything could have happened. The interruption unnerves Kreb and he decides to pack up his shovel and move further along the beach. He only drives a kilometre before the car gets bogged in the soft sand. Using sticks and whatever else he can find close by, he tries unsuccessfully to release the vehicle. Frustrated, he leaves the car and walks to the road. He hitches a ride to a service station near Caves Beach and then returns with two tow truck operators who free the car from the sand. The tow truck driver um, noticed that uh, he had a cut finger and obviously this cut finger was from the this murder scene. He also had a wound on his leg as well. The tow truck driver said to him, you better get that attended to. Cribb goes to nearby Belmont Hospital and receives two stitches to his finger. He abandons his plans to bury the bodies and drives to Mawson Hotel at Caves Beach. He spends the remainder of the morning and most of the afternoon drinking beer and talking to two locals while his gruesome cargo remains concealed in the car. He's had a beer with him and he's come up to us and said, um, do you mind if I sit down and talk to you? Have a chat? And he said, oh, no, go ahead. We sort of were looking at him because he had um, blood on his clothes, he had bandage on his hand, and he sort of said to us, oh, I'd, I'd been up to his brother's place at Dungog or somewhere like that, um, rabbiting and um, getting the pelts, the rabbit pelts. And he said, that's why you know, he's cut his hand with the knife and blood from the rabbits. As it got late into the evening, he decided to leave the hotel and he headed south towards Sydney along the Pacific Highway. Just somewhere near uh, Swansea, I think it was from memory, he called into a service station to get some petrol and uh, spoke to the fellow at the service station. And the fellow at the service station could smell the alcohol on his breath. Um, and just said to him, I don't think you should be driving. But anyway, Cribb uh, got some petrol and he uh, headed off towards Sydney. But on route, just south of Caves Beach, he, uh, he ran off the road uh, and the vehicle went down into the scrub. He went back to the same garage and tried to engage the services of the same tow truck 
that had pulled him out of the uh, out of the bog situation back at Caves Beach earlier. So he then uh, made arrangements for the vehicle to be towed out early the following morning, and then he went on his way back towards uh, uh, Wickham, which is a suburb just out of, on the north side of Newcastle, uh, to stay with some friends. Soon after, seven o'clock on Sunday morning, three tow truck operators go to retrieve the car. Following Cribb's instructions, they locate it down an embankment off the Pacific Highway, just south of Caves Beach. They hook up cables and begin to drag it up to the highway. Suddenly, the boot lid springs open, revealing the horrific contents. The bound and gagged bodies of Valda Connell and her two young children. Police from Newcastle and surrounding areas rush to the scene and immediately alert the Sydney CIB. It's a Sunday morning. Uh, it was about uh, 20 to 9. We were all ready to go to uh, church, 9 o'clock. And uh, I remember looking out the window and seeing uh, the, uh, the uh, homicide detective cars because we could see probably a quarter of a mile away. Uh, and as I said, not much traffic that went by the road, we could see the homicide cars coming down, uh, three of them. I knew straight away that uh, we were going to get some news and I guess I feared it would be bad. And we had been told that morning that they'd been found and they were dead. And then I saw my uncle crying and I said to somebody, why is Philip crying? And my auntie said, because his sisters died. But I was like in shock, I, I don't think I could actually take it in. I can remember the knock on the door. I can remember someone crying out. And then I can remember uh, one of the policemen, together with uh, a dear last cell brother, um, came up the stairs and took me into a room and said, uh, they found your mother and brother and sister and uh, they've all been killed. We were all told that they'd been found. I remember thinking, they're not coming home. She was a mum that was, uh, was always there for, for everybody, all six of us. She's very feminine, very um, soft. Even with six kids, she would never go out of the house without lipstick on and without her hair done. And um, she was a very feminine lady. Sally was uh, uh, a lovely little girl, um, always smiling. Um, she was halfway between uh, still a baby in some ways, uh, but on the other hand, uh, starting to become a, uh, a young lady. It was, it was great to have a brother finally come on the scene. There was a lot of fuss when he was born. A special little kid uh, to me, probably because he was my only brother. I can almost see it was just the end of the world. Our whole world was dragged out from underneath us because nothing functioned in our home again. Crib kidnapped and raped Mrs Connell, tied up all three and methodically stabbed them to death. The Pacific Highway south of Newcastle becomes a crime scene and homicide detectives Mike Hagen and Rick Campbell make their way from Sydney. Can I say that um, in 31 years of policing, 10 years of those at homicide and having attended uh, numerous homicide scenes, attended uh, the scenes of death and, and all sorts of things. It was probably the most horrific sight that I have ever seen in my life, without doubt. The bodies are eventually transported to the morgue while the Holden Kingswood car is taken to Newcastle Police Station for closer forensic examination. 
There are blood smears on the steering wheel and fingerprints are found on the stolen property belonging to the Connells, including the shotgun, which is retrieved from the back seat of the car. The tow truck driver tells police about the driver's cut finger and how he had sent him to Belmont Hospital to have it seen to. Police go to the hospital and they find the man with the cut finger has given his name, John Ernest Cribb. They quickly match Cribb's fingerprints on record with those found at the Connell House and on the stolen property. Police now have clear identification. A full description is sent out and a statewide manhunt begins. By midday, reports of the triple murders head news bulletins, along with the description of the wanted driver. Meanwhile, Cribb is visiting friends at a house in Throsby Street, Wickham, a suburb of Newcastle. He's slept there overnight and spends Sunday hanging around the house. Two visitors, Bettina and Kerry Edson, ask him about the bloodstains on his clothing and Cribb replies he's been kangaroo shooting. He also tells them he smashed his car. Before I left home is when I heard the radio announcement of um, the police were looking for this dangerous person, Australian, gave his age, gave a description of what he was wearing, jeans and flannelette t-shirt and stuff. And in particular, they mentioned about silver rings he had on and a silver bracelet. And I was just checking him out and looking at the jewellery and looking at him and asked him some questions about where he'd been and he said he'd been out ruse shooting. He, had, he wanted to go get his car. There was something in the car that he didn't want the police to find. And just things didn't add up and I just started thinking, this is the guy, definitely, that they're looking for. And they made a phone call. But in the meantime, Cribb had left that house with his friends and gone to another house in Union Street in the same suburb. We knocked on the door and gained entry by telling the people at that house that he'd, he'd been involved in an accident and he wanted to use the telephone. Immediately he went inside. There was a, uh, an elderly lady and her daughter present at the house. Uh, he wasn't in there long when two, uh, I believe, two male neighbours then came uh, and he, uh, they whisked the daughter away from the house, but uh, Cribb then grabbed the elderly lady and dragged her into the laundry area of the house. And it was at about this time the police cars started pulling me out the front. It was a police siege of um, some magnitude and went from late afternoon till the wee hours of the morning. By this time, after midnight, things settled down. Two big, burly police officers crashed through the back door, grabbed him. He was sitting on the floor with a blanket around his shoulders and uh, a washing machine jammed against the door. They had to push past. The victim beside him, she wasn't hurt. They grabbed him, wrestled him, and handcuffed him face down onto the concrete. When police burst into the house, Cribb attempts to stab himself in the chest. He's taken to Newcastle's John Hunter Hospital, but is soon released with a superficial wound. He's then taken to Newcastle Police Station, where he's interviewed. When asked why after the botched break and enter, he didn't just take the car and escape. Cribb admits he took Valda and her children because he was afraid they would go to the police. Cribb is cooperative and even agrees to take police on what was then referred to as a runaround. Handcuffed to a detective, he returns to each of the locations he took Valda and the children retracing his every move. Cribb is charged with three counts of murder and one of rape. The court schedules a committal hearing for November 1978. With Cribb's confession, the mounting forensic evidence and witnesses, the case for the prosecution appears airtight. But not everything goes to plan, and this is not the end of Cribb's reign of terror.
In November 1978, John Ernest Cribb appears before the Newcastle Court of Petty Sessions. The evidence is overwhelming and he's remanded to face trial. The magistrate also requests that Cribb undergo a psychiatric evaluation. He is interviewed by a prison psychiatrist and is diagnosed as suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. The authorities transfer Cribb for treatment to Morisset Hospital, a psychiatric facility situated on Lake Macquarie between Sydney and Newcastle. On the 4th of April um, 1979, um, Rick and I were in the Homicide Office at the Central CIB and we were informed that uh, John Ernest Cribb had escaped from Morissette Hospital. My understanding was that four people had escaped from Morissette, uh, two had been recaptured and there was two criminals still on the run, uh, William Munday and John Cribb. I remember saying to Dad, one on one, what happens if he does come back to our house again? What do we do? And I remember Dad looking at me and saying, well, I hope he does, and I hope I get a chance to get my hands on him. And I realised that I didn't have to be worried because, uh, yeah, certainly that's probably what he deserved. Over two weeks, Cribb and Mundy commit more than 30 offences, including assaults and robberies in both Newcastle and Sydney. There's mention of them nearly every day in the media, and the Connell family has to endure the terrible fear that Cribb may try to harm them again. Before they are caught, the fugitives abduct two teenage schoolgirls, holding them captive and repeatedly raping them for 35 hours. Cribb is found fit to plead and stands trial on the 22nd of May 1979. The weight of evidence is so strong that he quickly pleads guilty. However, Cribb's defence counsel raises the issue of his mental state and they ask the court, was Cribb in his right mind when he killed Valda, Sally and Damien? After listening to expert witnesses, Justice Roden dismisses Cribb's mental health as grounds for defence. For the murders of 39-year-old Valda Connell, 10-year-old Sally and 4-year-old Damien, Justice Roden sentences Cribb to three life terms in prison. I think Cribb was a cold, ruthless, calculating individual. Uh, he's a, he was a person devoid of, of the normal feelings of a human being. He, he displayed a very cool, calm, calculating uh, demeanour, uh, and he showed absolutely no remorse for what he'd done. One of the things that uh, I think we experienced, which was even more painful, is that you would have beautiful dreams. And uh, you would have dreams about the good times. But then you would wake up and realise that your life had become a nightmare. And that's what the day would be. So that, that was certainly difficult. But you had to cope, you had to get on. Now you would have thought this would be the end of the matter, but it isn't. In 1990, the New South Wales government introduces the notorious truth in sentencing law, intended to make sure a life term means jailed for life. But this allows prisoners like Cribb, who are serving life sentences, to apply to have their sentence redetermined. Cribb's wife and family left without comment. His application is heard before Justice Newman in the Supreme Court in 1993. Cribb claims, with the support of religious leaders, mental health workers and even some prison guards, that he's reformed and wants to live a normal life. With his application, Cribb writes a letter explaining his reasons for killing Valda, Sally and Damien. He claims that Valda had told him ten years prior to the murders 
that he was Sally's father and that she had since denied it. Justice Newman is scathing of the letter, describing it as grotesque lies and only further evidence of Cribb's lack of contrition and heartless lack of sympathy for his victims. Cribb's application is rejected. He makes a second application in 2008, but then withdraws it the day before it is scheduled for hearing. Uh, in this last hearing, he didn't turn up. Uh, he put our family through the agony of preparing, of reliving the drama, and then the night before, pulled the pin. Under the Truth in Sentencing legislation, Cribb and others like him could apply for redetermination every three years. This meant that for uh, families like us, uh, not only did you have to go through the tragedy back in uh, 78, again when he escaped in 79, again when he made application in uh, the mid-90s, but uh, we could be faced with having to go through this every three years for the rest of his life. Determined to keep her killer locked up. So it ended up that the law was changed, not just for the Connell family, but for many other families who once again, the murderer had the power. And so the law was changed very quickly. Both the opposition and the government had no qualms in passing this legislation that meant that the murderer can apply for a redetermination of their sentence once more. And after that, it would be up to the judge's dis discretion whether they spent the rest of their lives in jail or whether they got a determinate sentence. Since its inception in 1993, Martha Jabour and the Homicide Victim Support Group have helped thousands of people who've been affected by murder. I think Martha's like an angel out there. She helped me so much. 30 years on, I wish Martha had been around in 1978. Sadly for us, there was no help. We were meant to just get on with things. And we're with the family forever. There are no timelines. There's not a time limit on how long a, a person can be with the Homicide Victims Support Group. We're here, we're set up for life. And so we're there for them for the rest of their lives. One of the hardest things for me throughout this whole process is to also see the pain and the grief that it's caused my dad. Uh, sometimes people will say to me, how do you survive such a horrible day? And clearly I've had nights and times where I've cried and cried. And as bad as it is to lose a mother and a brother and a sister, I think to lose your wife and your two children would be 10 times worse. Um, on many, many times, my dad has been my inspiration. For the people out there, the do-gooders and the people that believe in rehabilitation, for anyone that's watching, are the people with the responsibility in the courts that they must never forget the magnitude of this crime. And I stand here because of what my mother went through and because of what we all went through and because of the struggle and because of what my dad went through. And so many people that were affected on that day. Murder is something that kills the victims straight away, but lives within the victims' families forever. It is something that doesn't go away. And not only do you lose those loved ones, as you would perhaps in a tragic accident, 
but there are constant reminders. You know, when you hear the word murder, when uh, every Mother's Day, when you have occasions, uh, when as a family, you know, when my two children were born. Your mother in particular is someone there who, who is a special, should be a special part of your life. And to have her snatched away by the selfish, bastard at act by someone like John Cribb is a pain that just goes on forever. John Ernest Cribb died in 2018 at the age of 67 in Goulburn Supermax prison. The Connell family welcomed his death. Gary Connell admits to still feeling emotional. For 40 years, he waited for Cribb to die, but the death brought a mix of good feelings and bewilderment. He still has flashbacks picturing his mum, Damien and Sally, but says he's relieved the family now has absolute certainty that Cribb will never again be a danger to them or anyone else. The spotlight on Cribb directed attention away from his evil associate, William Billy Munday. Munday was already a ferocious sociopath when he escaped with Cribb from the Morrisett Hospital and the two went on that horrific crime spree across Sydney. He was so violent that later in prison, he killed a fellow inmate, earning him a life sentence. Munday, like Cribb, died a miserable, lonely death in prison.